watched it. Stand up, Mr. Benny, she's going to swear you in. I'm going to swear you in. Can you raise your right hand, please? Do you, under the penalty of perjury, swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Great, thank you. And just make sure you speak into the microphone. Sure, thank you. And not too fast. Got it. <laughs> please introduce yourself to the court, sir. My name is William Banks. What do you do for a living? I'm a law professor. Where are you a law professor? I've been a law professor at Syracuse University in Syracuse, New York since 1978. What do you teach at Syracuse? I teach courses in constitutional law, national security law, counterterrorism law, uh, domestic law, the military, uh, various seminars on subjects related to those areas. Now, in addition to teaching, do you do anything else at Syracuse? Yes, I, I founded an institute in 2003 called the Institute for National Security and Counterterrorism, which was uh, created to provide opportunities for graduate students and law students to in, engage in advanced study to enter careers in the national security field, primarily in the government and in the military in Washington, D.C. Is there anything else you do related to national security issues? I've done a number of uh, of uh, projects for the Department of Defense and civilian agencies in our government, uh, providing for emergency preparedness and response, exercises, case studies, simulations, and the like, where senior members have come to Syracuse or me to Washington to uh, work through some scenarios, red teaming, and the like, to better prepare for crisis situations. What have you been asked to do in this case? I've been asked to prepare a report and then provide testimony on the legal authorities that President Trump had at his disposal to quell the violence on January 6th. And are you prepared to testify about that here today? I am. Uh, have you ever served in the military? I have not. Um, but have you worked with the military? In those contract cases that I mentioned a moment ago, I've had several consulting relationships with entities inside the defense over the years, yes. And have you ever advised the military? Uh, with respect to emergency preparedness and response and follows up to those case studies and simulations I have, yes. Well, if you never served in the military, how did you get interested in national security law? Short story, uh, please indulge. In 1987, uh, President Reagan and Gorbachev were at one of their well-known summits and efforts to try to develop a, a framework for the reduction of the nuclear stockpile. After a few of those meetings, they had become pretty friendly with one another, and they approached the dais to have a press conference after one such session, and they didn't realize that the microphones were on. They were joking with one another about having their fingers on the nuclear button. That happened to be a Saturday, and for reasons that I can't recall, I was in my office and my phone rang, and it was a reporter, a national reporter from somewhere, and she asked, could the President of the United States just do that? Could he whimsically launch nuclear weapons? You know, thinking as quickly as I could, I said, I don't think so, but I'm not sure why. So on the basis of that, uh, gnawing concern that I had. I gathered with some other colleagues around the United States in American legal education, and we essentially created a new field of study of national security law, wrote a case for it, 
which is now in production and going into its eighth edition, used in more, more than 100 American law schools. What does your academic scholarship focus on? It focuses on those same areas. I have near, nearly 200 books and articles on subjects of constitutional law, national security law, presidential power, counterterrorism law, in recent years, a fair number of pieces in cybersecurity. Have you written any books or articles on the topic you're here to testify on today, namely the president's authority to respond to domestic security threats? The, the most prominent book is called Soldiers on the Home Front, The Domestic Role of the American Military. It was published by Harvard University Press mm -hmm. in 2016. Roughly how many articles and books do you think you've written related to the topic of the president's authority to deal with domestic security threats? Somewhere between 30 and 40. Have you given any presentations or lectures on that topic? Many of them, around the United States and around the world, yes. Give me an estimate of how many you think. 30. Uh, are you a member of any professional organizations related to the topic you are here to testify on today? Yes, I'm a member of the American Bar Association Standing Committee on Law and National Security. I just completed my second term as chair. That committee was created by Justice Lewis Powell in 1962. It's the oldest standing committee of the ABA. I'm also the past president of the Association of American Law Schools uh, section on national security law. Where did you go to law school? About four blocks from here at the University of Denver. When did you graduate from DU? 1974, when the law school was still downtown. <laughs> did, did, I was going yeah, to say, did, did you get any other degrees? Yes, I stayed on at DU and uh, took a course of study called Master of Science in Law and Society. It was a post-law master's. It no longer is available here, I believe, but uh, I, I achieved that degree in 1982. Now, when again did you start teaching at Syracuse? In 1978, so I was uh, studying and, and, and teaching at the same time for a bit. And when did you start teaching national security law and related topics? After the Reagan Gorbachev uh, meetings, we started, I think my first class was 1989, and the book was first published in 1990. So before moving to your opinions, I wanted to ask you about any research you did specific uh, to this case. What, if anything, did you review regarding the January 6, 2021 attack and events leading up to it in coming to your opinions in this case? I reviewed several documents, including the, the January 6 committee report, the, uh, the Department of Defense timeline surrounding the January 6 period, the Inspector General report of the Department of Defense completed in the following year, uh, the provisions of the District of Columbia Code, provisions of the United States Code, sections of the United States Constitution, several scholarly articles. Um, Your Honor, at this point, we would like to tender Professor Banks as an expert in the U.S. President's powers to prevent or stop domestic attacks on the government and the authorities that President Trump had to call on to stop the attack on January 6th. Your Honor, what would you do our set of two objections this is, uh, he's testifying on an issue of law that the court is better and better equipped to handle, and then um, it's not appropriate to have um, legal opinions that come in as actual reports. As actual testimonies. Uh, I will, uh, <clears throat> to the extent you're renewing your motion, I have a motion for the same reasons I did in my written ruling, uh, and I will. Admit him as an expert on um, national security and the, I think it was the presidential powers to uh, respond to a domestic attack. Yes, Your Honor. So the, the president's authority is to respond to a domestic attack. Correct. No. Can I ask you a question though before we sure. go on? Where was the DU Law School? <laughs> across the street from the art museum. Oh. No idea. No. You learn something new every day. It was a pretty small structure. In fact, all the clinical programs had to be in downtown office buildings. And I did many of those. So I spent about half my time at the school and half in the clinics, which then joined the old YMCA, I think. Oh, okay. yeah. A little trivia. <laughs> it is.
So I wanted to start with one of the findings from the January 6th committee that I think you referenced in your report. And this is from page 577 of the January 6th report. Um, and it, we've got a highlight here. It says, President Trump could have called top officials at the Department of Justice, the Department of Homeland Security, the Department of Defense, the FBI, the Capitol Police Department, or the D.C. Mayor's Office to ensure that they quell the violence. Was that one of the findings in the January 6th report that you reviewed? It was. What is your view of that finding? I think the finding is correct. Why? Well, uh, the President had a plentiful authority to respond to the January 6th attack, including uh, by reference to all the departments that are included in that sentence that you just reviewed. In addition to that, as many uh, here know, he's also the commander of the D.C. National Guard, and they have a very potentially important role. Well, let me stop you there, and I, I want to start asking you some questions specific to the D.C. National Guard. Yes. What authority does the U.S. President have over the D.C. National Guard? The President of the United States is in a unique position vis-a-vis -vis the D.C. National Guard. He's the commander. He's the commander, uh, notwithstanding any uh, interest that the mayor or anyone else in the district might have. And he's been the commander of the D.C. National Guard since 1889, at the time when Congress uh, conferred that position by statute on the president. Uh, there was no local government in the District of Columbia. As we know, in every other state, uh, the governor is the commander of the militia when they're drawn out in state capacity because there's no governor. Uh, in D.C., and Congress has not seen fit, at least up to this time, to confer that status of command on the uh, mayor. The president has been consistently in charge of the D.C. National Guard since 1889. Roughly how many members of the D.C. National Guard were there on January 6th? I'm told there were around 2,000, uh, 1,100 or so, uh, who were activated by that day. Um, and you talked about this a little bit, but how does the president's authority over the D.C. National Guard differ from his authority over National Guards in other states? It's, it's uniquely different. There's a principle in, uh, in American law called posse comitatus. The Latin stands for power of the county, which is neither here nor there. But the posse comitatus law was enacted after the Civil War to establish a baseline presumption that we don't want members of the military enforcing civilian laws. We've always entrusted civilian law enforcement to civilians, and we, as a culture, and as a society, have wanted to keep it that way. The exception to that principle are the National Guards of the various states and the District of Columbia. When those forces are called out by the governor, or in the case of D.C., by the President of the United States, they are in what's called the militia capacity active duty state capacity and posse comitatus does not apply. So they may supplement law enforcement by their own force. And that force was available to the president on January 6th. Well, let me ask you this, just packing up. You had said that posse comitatus does not apply to the D.C. National Guard? That's correct. So can the D.C. National Guard then be deployed to engage in what would traditionally be law enforcement activities? They may. And who has the authority to do that? The President of the United States. Does the President, in order to deploy the D.C. National Guard, need the permission or a request from the mayor of D.C.? He does not. Does he need permission or a request from anyone? No, he does not. If President Trump, in the days leading up to January 6th, had been concerned about the potential for violence, what could he have done regarding the D.C. National Guard? Objection, Your Honor. He leading the witness now. Oh, you can go ahead. Do you, you need a question again? Or? If President Trump in the days leading up to January 6th had been concerned about the potential for violence, what, if anything, could he have done with the D.C. National Guard? He could have, he could have deployed them or arranged for them to be on call or ready to be deployed on January 6th. Again, what sort of permission or request would he have needed from the mayor? He would need no request or permission from any other official. Once President Trump knew that a mob, a violent mob, was attacking the Capitol on January 6th, what, if anything, could he have done with the D.C. National Guard? He could have immediately ordered them to report to the Capitol. Would he have needed any request or permission from the mayor? No. 
Um, now, put aside January 6th, and let's go back in time a little bit. Have you seen any evidence of President Trump deploying the D.C. National Guard uh, in Washington, D.C. prior to the November uh, 2020 election? In the summer of 2020, I believe it was early June, the President deployed the National Guard and various law enforcement personnel in the wake of the protests surrounding the murder of George Floyd. Did the President need any permission to do that? He did not. Do you recall if there was a request from the mayor's office for him to do that? There was not. Now, there's been some suggestion already in this case that prior to January 6th, President Trump authorized 10 to 20,000 National Guard troops to be available uh, at the Capitol. Uh, is that even possible? It would have been very difficult to envision, and I've seen no, nothing in the record that indicates that that uh, order by the president was ever issued. Uh, why, the reason I say it would have been uh, uh, difficult is that the National Guard, when federalized by the President of the United States, he certainly has the legal authority to do that, to call National Guard from anywhere and federalize them. They then are subject to the Posse Comitatus principle and could not have engaged in direct law enforcement in D.C. If he's going to rely on National Guard from the governors of the joint states, for example, he may well do that. And they then are not subject to posse comitatus, but then they're subject to the command of their governor, not the command of the president of the United States. So I want to break that down. So there's the 10 to 20,000 number. How many roughly DC National Guard over which the president had authority were there? There were up to 1,100. About 340 had been pre-positioned on that day for duties unrelated to law enforcement. If the president had, in fact, authorized far more than that, you would have had to go through governors. Yes. Um, if the president had, in fact, authorized 10 to 20,000 National Guard troops to be, a bit, be available on January 6th, what type of documentation would you expect to have seen? We would have seen uh, a zombie on um, This is way beyond his expert report. And if I remember correctly, you had said that because we went to a deposition, suggestions would be limited to their expert reports. That, that is absolutely true. Uh, I was just going to bring up where it is. Uh, the first full paragraph? Uh, this is, we served the supplemental expert report, Your Honor. Um, and this is on page three of that supplemental expert report. And this is addressed uh, right there. Can you give me a few minutes to find it? Well, in my, in my documents. It's clearly there, so um, I'm going to... What page are you looking at? It's page three of the supplemental report. First sentence of the first full paragraph. Yeah, it's actually a, a full paragraph on this topic. It carries over page four. Thank you, Your Honor. Objection of rules. Uh, what documentation would you have expected to see if there had, in fact, been an authorization of 10 to 20,000 National Guard troops to be available on January 6th? We would have seen documentation inside the Department of Defense, and we would have also seen documentation from the National Guard Bureau for any forces that came from adjoining states. Why would you expect to see documentation when 10 to 20,000 troops have been authorized? Uh, because that's a significant number. They're not DC National Guard. They're either going to be federalized, again, in which case, Posse Comitatus would prevent them from law enforcement, or they're coming from adjoining states, probably Maryland and Virginia, and the, the uh, governors of those states and the commands in those states would have had to issue orders to their force. Did you review documents in this case to see whether there were, in fact, records of an authorization of 10 to 20,000 troops? I did review the, uh, the Inspector General's report of the, of the Department of Defense that was compiled during the year after the January 6 events, and I also reviewed the uh, the January 6th committee report extensively, and in neither case did I see any indication of an order for that uh, size of magnitude of force from anywhere. Uh, I want to show you what's been submitted as Exhibit TV. It's one of President Trump's exhibits, and we would move to admit it. I assume there'll be no objection. TV, it was the three page Department of Defense timeline. Well, I'm going to call it TV for the moment. I'll let you know, Your Honor, we have no objection to it being admitted. Okay. So I'm going to show the 
this to you, uh, Professor. Do you recognize uh, what's marked here as Exhibit TV? I do. It's the Department of Defense timeline on the days surrounding January 6th. Um, is there anything, well, who put together that timeline? The Pentagon. Uh, is there anything in that timeline reflecting a presidential authorization of 10 to 20,000 National Guard troops? There is not. What does that suggest to you? That it never happened. What other documents, if any, did you review to determine if there was an authorization of 10 to 20,000 troops? Again, I read carefully through the DOD Inspector General report that was compiled later that year and then made no reference to such a decision by the President. What about the January 6th report? Likewise, extensively reviewed and no, no mention of such an authorization. Now, I want to go to an entry on January 3rd, 2021. Do you see that? Yes. And there's a bullet point, the third bullet point, and what I've learned from doing this is the military really likes acronyms. So uh, I'm going to spell them out, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, the third bullet point says, uh, Acting Secretary of Defense and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff meet with the President. The President concurs an activation of the D.C. National Guard to support law enforcement. Could that be an authorization of 10 to 20,000 troops? It could not. You see a couple of things about that bullet point. One is the reference there is to the D.C. National Guard, not to any forces. And there weren't 10 or 20,000 D.C. National Guard personnel available for deployment on that day. And second, that if we look back up the timeline, you see that the Sunday, January 3 bullets are in partially a response to a request by Mayor Bowser and uh, Homeland Security Chief Rodriguez from December 31, requesting a, a modest number of National Guard personnel to perform traffic uh, duties, metro enforcement, and a few other things on that day, totaling about 340 personnel. So I want to ask you about that in just a second. Your Honor, housekeeping matter, it's Exhibit 1027. And no objection, Mr. Wood? No, Your Honor. Um, 1027 is admitted. Now, you said earlier there's no reflection of an authorization of 10 to 20,000 troops in this timeline put together by the Department of Defense. But is there a discussion of some much smaller number of troops? Yes, that's the, the 340 now that you're uh, going to highlight on the uh, Monday, the 4th of January. Uh, this was Mayor Bowser's request, and you see there traffic control, two shifts of 90, metro station support, two shifts of 24, a so-called WMD civil support team, which was about 20, uh, and then command and control personnel 52, and on top of that, it was authorized uh, a, a quick reaction force of 40, which would be staged at, at Joint Base Andrews, but available for deployment if needed. So the 340. Were those deployed in the Capitol, meaning Washington, D.C., not at the Capitol building, on January 6th? Uh, the, not the 40 the, that remained at Andrews. The 340. The, of, the, of the remaining, that 300, those 300 personnel, yes, they were deployed. And again, they were in two shifts, so they weren't all there at one time. But about half of them would have been at either a traffic control point or a metro station or in a command and control center uh, during during the entire day. And, and that's my fault. It's 300 around the city and 40 at Andrews Air Force Base. That's correct. So what were the 40 at Andrews Air Force Base doing? Well, they were awaiting uh, instruction to move to uh, the district uh, because they were simply uh, there to respond to, uh, to a disturbance if one broke out. A disturbance. A disturbance if one broke out. What, if anything, could President Trump have done on January 6th with regard to the 300 troops stationed around the city and the 40 troop quick reaction force at Andrews Air Force Base once he knew that the Capitol was under attack? Once he learned that that force had already been deployed inside the district and he, he could see from his own uh, video screen that violence was breaking out at the Capitol, he could have redeployed them from their existing stations to, to the Capitol with a, with the time, uh, a limited amount of time needed to get there, and then also to be equipped with, uh, with riot gear. 
right there was apparently uh, stored in convenient places near their present places of deployment. In your review of the documents, did you see any evidence that President Trump did that? No. Uh, we talked about what he could have done with the D.C. National Guard. Is there anything that he could have done with regard to the Virginia or Maryland National Guard units once he knew the Capitol was under attack? He could have, he could have spoken with the governors of those respective states or either one of them and, and approved their deployments of their forces to the Capitol as quickly as possible. Now that would take longer. That would take a longer. There's the time to get from Maryland or Virginia to the capital, and there's also the communication that would have to go on between the, the Pentagon and those National Guard officials. In your review of the evidence in this case, did you see anything to suggest that President Trump employed that authority? He did not. Um, now, we've discussed what President Trump had done with the National Guard. Was that the only? law enforcement entity that he could have called on that day? No, he, he could have called on other executive branch agencies to deploy personnel. Let me show you what's been marked as plaintiff's exhibit 148 at, sorry, page 77. And you see a tweet there? Yes. Who is that tweet from? From uh, President Trump. What date was that tweet sent? January 5, 5.25 p.m. The night before the January 6th attack? Yes. Um, and what does Mr. Trump say? He's warning Antifa to stay out of Washington. He said law enforcement is watching. And then he tags various uh, executive branch entities, including the Pentagon, the Justice Department, the Department of Homeland Security, Actually, the Department of Interior, that's Secretary Bernhardt, and the Secret Service, of course, the FBI, is the Department of Justice. How, if at all, do those tagged entities relate to the law enforcement authorities that President Trump could have mobilized on January 6th when he saw that the Capitol was under attack? Particularly the, the, the first three, uh, or the first, the second, the Justice Department and DHS have personnel that could have been brought to the Capitol from headquarters very quickly on that day. Uh, rapid response teams that could have deployed to the Capitol on the order of the President. Um, what could uh, he have done with the Department of Homeland Security? They likewise have a rapid response team that could have deployed in a matter of minutes from headquarters to the Capitol. You said Secretary of uh, Secretary Bernhardt is the Secretary or was the Secretary of the Interior? <coughs> What relevance does the Secretary of the Interior have to law enforcement personnel that could have been mobilized on January 6th? That department includes the National Park Service. And the, <coughs> the President's speech earlier that day was from the Ellipse, which is on the territory uh, for which the National Park Service is responsible. And what about the Secret Service? They have, of course, a, a protective detail, a large uh, segment of protective personnel who could have been constructed either by the Secretary of DHS or by the President himself to respond to the crisis. How about the FBI? Likewise, Department of Justice, they would have been among the first personnel that the Attorney General would have contacted if there was a call from the President. What authority does the President of the United States have over all of those entities? The simplest and most direct authority is his responsibility as Chief Executive under Article II of the Constitution to take care that all the laws be faithfully executed. That includes faithfully executing the transition and the counting of electoral votes on the day appointed. And do all those entities report up ultimately to the president? They do. What if any evidence have you seen that President Trump took any action to deploy any of these entities on January 6th? I've seen no such evidence. Um, who else in the world had all of those authorities at their disposal on January 6th. No one else. No further questions. Cross examination.
Good afternoon, uh, Professor Banks. How are you today? We met briefly earlier. Yes, we did. We did. Um, so, I want to talk a little bit about your qualifications. Um, you've been a professor in national security for a while, you said, um, and you've had some uh, contract experience with the military. Um, have you, um, what's your experience in advising governors or presidents in national security issues? I've never advised a governor or a president. And have you ever, um, um, so, so you've never actually advised a, a president on actually declaring an emergency or activating the National Guard, is that correct? Only in a war game scenario with hypothetical players. <clears throat> And so, so your advice, to, your, your testimony today is, frankly, not, not about practicality, but more about what the law says. Isn't that correct? Well, it's about what the law says in a, in a practical situation of crisis. Well, but you've never been in that kind of crisis, so you wouldn't really know if, how the laws would actually interact in that situation, would you? I've simulated those crises many times. But, but you've never actually been in one, correct? Uh, not um, Mr. Blue. I, I went over him again, right? Yeah, just, just uh, both of you try not to talk over each other for the court reporter. Sorry, Your Honor. Sorry to the court reporter. Um, if we could pull up Exhibit 1045, please. 1045. Uh, Professor Banks, sorry, I was spacing on your name for a second. This is a, uh, a letter from June 4th uh, from Mayor Bowser to President Trump, correct? Yes. Have you seen this letter before? I have. And um, you've, you've read it, but you did not consider this letter in your expert report because it wasn't listed as one of the uh, things you thought you uh, looked at, is it? That's correct. And if you would look at um, the, the last sentence of the first paragraph, and could you read, start with therefore, could you read that please, out loud? Therefore, I am requesting that you withdraw all extraordinary federal law enforcement and military presence from Washington, D.C. Thank you. And, and now I know earlier you testified that the president has sole authority, whatever. Um, are you aware about how that authority has been delegated? Yes. And could you explain to the court what that is? In a 1969 executive order, <coughs> President Nixon actually delegated to the Secretary of Defense and then to the Secretary of Army by a memorandum of the day-to-day -day authority over deployment decisions with regard to the National Guard. Thank you. Um, and you had testified earlier that, um, at, uh, that th this letter came from the summer during the Black Lives Matter protests and riots, correct? That's correct. And, um, and are you aware of whether Mayor Bowser approved of the uh, deployment of National Guard at that time? I haven't seen nothing to indicate that she did. Do you, have you seen anything to indicate that she did not approve of it? I have not. So this is the only document we have that refer references that, correct? Yes, so far as I know. And isn't it true that once uh, President Trump received this letter, the National Guard was removed from Washington, D.C. at the time? I believe that's true. I didn't study those incidents carefully. And if you could read the, uh, the, the last sentence of the third paragraph, please. Yes. The deployment of federal law enforcement personnel and equipment are inflaming demonstrators and adding to the grievances of those who by and large are peacefully protecting, protesting for change and the reference to the racist and broken systems that are killing black Americans. Reforms, I'm sorry. To the racist and broken systems that are killing black Americans. I'm failing my vision test here. So. Did you see that a little bit? I can't. There you go. Yeah, I can't. But Joanna can. So the reason I, I want to talk about this letter for a moment is um, there, while there may not be, while there's formal authorities, correct, there are also informal relationships and informal authorities in, uh, involved in the governmental process, correct? Been my and and President Trump and, and Mayor Bowser are um, are the two people who have authority in Washington D.C. Correct? But only the president has authority. I, I didn't ask that question. I appreciate that. 
Um, but, but they're the ones with the authority in Washington, D.C., correct? Yes. And while President Trump may have um, actual legal authority, he, he has to work with Mayor Bowser going forward, correct? Yes, he does. Um, and, and when you were giving your opinion, it doesn't appear that you considered at all the political ramifications or, the, or that relationship between President Trump and Mayor Bowser? I, I was giving legal opinion, I think, regarding the authorities of the president and the mayor, if any, during that period. All right, if we could go to Exhibit 148, please. And we're going to be going to page 6. And we're going to talk about the May 30 tweet, please. And, and you used the, you referenced this tweet in your report, didn't you? Yes. And why did you reference this tweet? It's, a, it's an indication that President Trump was uh, familiar with the uses of the National Guard for national security. And are you aware of how the National Guard um, ultimately was deployed into Minneapolis? I don't know the details of that answer, no. So you don't know, in, in fact, you did not address the, in your report or here, that uh, President Trump did not unilaterally order the National Guard into Minneapolis, did he? He did not. I believe that was the governor's deployment. Right. Okay. So that, and that was the governor's decision, correct? Yes. In your report, you also mentioned the fact that President Trump should have activated the National Guard on January 5th, right? Yes. Um, and. January 5th? No. I, I, my determination was that he should have activated the National Guard in response to the violence that broke out on January 6th. Oh, okay. Excuse me, Your Honor, I apologize. I did not expect to have to find this in the report. No worries. Well, let's, let's, let's do this a different way. Um, so leading up to, uh, leading up to um, um, January 6th, we can go to exhibit 156, please. And exhibit 156 is a tweet from Mayor Bowser that includes a letter that she sent to um, President Trump, correct? I'm not to President Trump, but to the United States Attorney General, the Acting Secretary of the Senate Defense, and the Secretary of the Army, correct? And, and, and remind us, who actually had command authority of uh, the D.C. National Guard through the delegation of authority? President Trump delegated to the acting secretary at the time and then the secretary of the Army. So, so the secretary of defense who then delegated on down to the secretary of the Army, right? Yes. So this letter was to the two individuals that had been delegated the authority by President Nixon, and that, and that delegation was still in, in effect at the time, correct? That's correct. Right. And um, if you read the, the, the tweet from um, Mayor Bowser, um, she talks about that she's not requesting any other federal law enforcement personnel and discourages any additional deployment without notification or consult, consultation, correct? Yes. So she was making it very clear on the day before January 6th that she didn't want National Guard, didn't she? That's right. She was not anticipating a violent attack on the Capitol, however. Well, I, and, and, and that's true. And, and is it your testimony today that President Trump was anticipating a uh, violent attack on the Trump, on the uh, Capitol? I do not know whether the President was anticipating. Okay. Attack. All right. And if in the letter, it's, and you've read this letter before, correct? Yes. Sir. And the letter says basically the same thing, doesn't it? It does. And so you're not your testimony is not that he should have actually deployed National Guard, not just the 300 or the 340, but the the 1100 who are available. You're not saying that he should have had them ready to go on January 5th to, to deploy on January 6th? No. 
นะครับคุณคิดว่าใครคุณ
And if we could go to page 48. And we'll look at the first paragraph. And again, we have Mr. Irving. And Mr. Irving, I'll represent, was the House Sergeant at Arms. All right. And he told the committees every Capitol Police daily intelligence report from January 4th through January 6th, including on January 6th, forecast a chance of civil disobedience and arrest during the protest as remote and improbable. Again, highlighting the fact that this was an unprecedented and unexpected event, correct? Correct. And if you go down just to the next paragraph, it says, months following the attack on the U.S. Capitol, there is still no consensus among the USCP, which is the United States Capitol Police, right? Yes. Officials about the intelligence report threat analysis ahead of January 6th, correct? Correct. So again, we're highlighting the fact that um, that there just was no intel that the intelligence what reports weren't clear and weren't being presented that suggested that this kind of event could happen. Correct? Yes. All right. And if we could move to Exhibit Ten Thirty One, please. And Exhibit Ten Thirty One is the um, Inspector General's report regarding January sixth. Correct. And you referenced this earlier in your testimony today, didn't you? I did. So you've read this document? I have. And if, you, if we could turn to page 18 of the, of the PDF. I have the page this time. And you'll look at um, where it says January 3rd, the one to the fourth block down, the fourth row. Yes. Um, and it says the president asked uh, Mr. Miller and General Milley about um, election protest pre uh, preparations, correct? Yep. Yes. And he was informed, we've got a plan and we've got it covered, correct? Correct. So the president at that point was informed that, that a plan was in place to take care of things, correct? Yes. Is there any reason that you would think that he would not believe that? No. Now you you have given us a number of um, options that the president had legally, correct? Yes. Um, and you haven't identified a single instance where the president has actually um, activated the national guard in a way that did not coordinate with the uh, the local political officials, correct? So he, you can't identify a time where he's activated the National Guard in Washington, D.C. without Mayor Bowser's approval. Without the Mayor of Washington, D.C.'s approval, correct? We're going to rewind that question a bit. I'm a little confused. I think in June of 2020, he called out those uh, units on his own volition without a request from the mayor. Well, earlier you said that she, you had no idea if, he, if she agreed with it or not, correct? It, he did this unilaterally, did it on his own authority in June or late May or whatever it was in 2020 in response to the Floyd protest. Okay, well, when we were talking about this earlier, I asked you if you knew if she approved it or if they talked about it or if they had a conversation, and you said you did not know. I don't know. Is that correct? Yes. So you do not know whether she actually was communicating with him about that? No, I don't. Correct. And I can't remember, did you say that the president could have declared a national emergency? Is that something you said? Uh, it's in my report. I don't believe I testified to it uh, this afternoon. Are you aware of a, a president declaring a national emergency within two or three hours of a riot starting? Oh, yes. Many times. Oh, really? Historically, yes. Okay. Yeah. Like what? Little Rock, 1950s. Birmingham, early 1960s. Los Angeles, 1984. Within three hours? Oh, yes. Okay. And are you aware of any debates that were going on inside the White House regarding the response to the uh, riots on January 6th? No. 
So you have no idea about whether the, what, why the decisions were being made not to, for the president not to actually do the things that you've said? No. You don't know if he considered doing them, do you? I do not. You're just saying that these are things that he possibly could have done, isn't that correct? All right, Your Honor, that's all I have, um, but I would like to admit uh, five exhibits we talked about today, 1031, 1045, 148, 156, and 22. Okay. Well, do you have any objections to any of them? No. Okay. Um, did you get the number? Can you repeat it one more time? I tried to go slow. Apparently, I have to go even slower. 1031, 1045, 148, 156, 22. What? I'm sorry, it's 1056. You sure? Because it's 156 on here. Hold on, let me, let me look at my notes. It's 156, not 1056. Ten thirty one, ten forty five, one four eight, one five six two two. Okay. Sounds like tax forms. <laughs> uh, briefly, uh, Your Honor, uh, you were asked a number of questions about whether in the lead up to January sixth there was any consensus about whether there might be violence that day. You recall that? As of 1.30 in the afternoon on January 6th, was there consensus about whether there was violence? Yes. What was that consensus? Violence was breaking out of the Capitol. Um, uh, objection, Your Honor. I'm not sure what the basis for that statement is other than being what you saw on TV. Overruled. Did you review the January 6th report and come to the opinions in your case? In this case? I did. I want to show you a few. Uh, the first one is finding 316. Oh, sorry, I looked it up. says by 1.21 p.m., President Trump was informed that the Capitol was under attack. You see that? Yes. Um, what, if anything, do you see the President or any evidence of the President doing prior to 4.17 with regard to exercising